Welcome. I'm pleased to be here today at the inaugural talk of the revived Liberal Arts Lecture Series. As we all know, the school has an extraordinary number of high-quality lectures and performances throughout the year, and I'm confident that I share the view of most faculty, students, and staff when I note that there are agonizing choices to be made about what to attend virtually every day of the week. I'm glad that you decided to attend today's talk by Professor Tosca. Professor Tosca's talk on the role of artists and designers in averting climate disaster strikes me as an apt topic for relaunching the series. The school has long played a role in bridging the so-called art-science divide. Pioneering departments such as ATS, which will celebrate its 50th anniversary next year, have for decades demonstrated the artificiality of any such divide between art and science. Our efforts gained added momentum, of course, with the appointment of Dr. Walter Massey as president in 2010, when art and science initiatives were made a school-wide priority. Liberal arts has a key role to play in helping the next generation of artists and designers gain scientific literacy and acquire the intellectual, and in some cases, technical tools to realize their artistic visions. It strikes me that artists can address pressing social and environmental issues such as climate change in at least two complementary ways. First, they can create art that shows, slows, excuse me, slows, reverses, or prepares us for the damaging change itself. Newton Harrison, who spoke recently at VAP, worked alongside his wife Helen for half a century in creating sustainable food systems, advancing reforestation, and creating healthier watersheds. The Harrisons blended the creative problem-solving skills of artists with the research and technical tools of scientists. And second, artists can use their art to make complex scientific principles comprehensible, relevant, and urgent to lay audiences, and so motivate a critical mass of citizenry to embrace the issues as their own. While this second approach is sometimes dismissed as nothing more than illus an illustration of the foundational discoveries made by scientists, the stakes of climate change are too high for us to ignore the critical importance of forging a consensus on the challenges all of us face. Grappling with climate issues in a way that resonates with non-scientists is essential work if we are to have any hope of building support for making the environment a priority in US society. I suspect that Professor Tosca will have more to say on these critical considerations. I know that all of us are eager to hear her thoughts. Thank you. Wow, thank you. It's not every day a scientist gets to give a talk in a really amazing room like this. Um, thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity to share some of the stuff that I've uh, been doing. It's If you're here expecting a, a a real technical science talk, which I know all of you are. Uh, I won't be doing that. Um, and hopefully this work uh, inspires you to think more deeply about the problem and how we solve this problem. So um, I'm gonna start right in with the, with, the, with the first slide. The background, some of you might recognize it, but um, it's an aesthetic representation of each year's uh, temperature departure from the normal. So you can see it's red on the right because it's warmer and it's blue on the left because it's colder. So this is gonna be sort of the theme of the talk is, sorry, it squeaks. Uh, so this is gonna be the theme of the talk is how can we bring together art and design and science to solve uh, what is, in my opinion, one of the most existential crises of our time, which is climate change. Uh, so I am a scientist, but first and foremost, at this school, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to start right in with something that I do uh, with all of my students on the first day of class, and I'm going to do it with you all here. So I hope that you will participate, and I know some of my students are here, so if no one participates, I expect you to participate. Um, and I want to start by asking you a question. I want to ask you, what is nature? I think we have an idea in our heads of what nature is. But when you try to define it, and when you try to, when you try to sort of put words to a visual, um, it gets increasingly more difficult. So I'm going to run through a few slides, um, and I want you to just raise your hand if you think that the image that I'm showing is nature. It's very simple. And then there's going to be a more complicated part after that, so don't use all your energy raising your hand. 
So how many people think that this picture is nature? Raise your hand. Okay. Good. Uh, what about this picture? Who thinks this picture is nature? Good. How about this? Is this nature? Okay, we're like losing a few people. How about this picture? Is this nature? Great. Okay, so there are some people in here who are really committed to every picture being nature, and then there are some who, you know, are wavering or are thinking about it uh, in different ways. So I want to ask you three questions, and you can raise your hand or just shout the answers back out to me in an orderly... Let's do raise our hands. Um, so the first question that I want to ask is, do you consider yourself, your physical self, a part of nature or separate from nature? Uh, the second question, and, and I'll get a, a few responses, maybe like two or three responses, um, is to list some words that you consider or associate with things that are natural or experiences that are natural, and then some things that are unnatural. Um, so first of all, let's get a show of hands. How many people in this room consider themselves a part of nature? Raise your hand. Okay, does anyone consider themselves not a part of nature? Raise your hand. Okay, good. So I want you to, I want you to sort of think, the, think about that and interrogate that. So maybe let's get maybe four or five things that you, words or things that you associate with the word natural. Organic, okay, what else? Kombucha, <laughs> good. <laughs> Contains carbon, good. Basalt, perfect, okay, great. Uh, what about some words or things that you associate with unnatural, that you consider unnatural? Plastic, okay. Anything else? Concrete? What else? Oh, sorry. Say it again. Cheetos. <laughs> Cheetos, and then there was something over here, too. Mechanical, good. So I'm not, I don't want to say too much because... Um, that's not my role, but I do find it interesting that all of the things that were listed as unnatural are created by people, yet pretty much everyone in here said that they were themselves a part of nature. So this is an interesting cognitive dissonance that I really want to explore together, and I explore with all of my students, and I think could help us get to a conclusion uh, or to a, a better direction in how we address the climate crisis. So, when we think about nature and our relationship to nature or within nature, it really forces us as human beings on this planet to consider what constitutes some sort of arbitrary boundary between natural and unnatural things. And these definitions or redefinitions or reinterrogations may ultimately, I would argue, help elucidate a, a clearer way forward, perhaps, for humanity as we consider how to collectively address uh, the climate crisis or, or climate change, and I want to um, I want to I want to share this uh, quote from one of my students who's here, um, who has thought a lot about nature, um, and I think it's a it's a good jumping off point. So uh, Patrick writes, I would posit that it is within our nature as humans to have a clear manifestation of ego and self, and this could very well explain the urge to classify ourselves separately from the rest of collective everything, as it assigns us individuality as a species, and that's like a really important point for me, because it's because of the, our human nature and this intellectual separations of humans from the rest of the earth that our species has irreparably damaged many of the systems that make our planet hospitable to us. And so I want to share this a bit heartbreaking slide, but I, it maybe perhaps is a call to action. The most important nature story of our time, and I'm sure you've all seen, you know, Planet Earth, Planet Earth 2, the most important nature story of our time is loss. And I want you to think about loss in the context of our relationship as human beings with nature. And I want to begin by talking about the role of aesthetics, of course, because I'm at an art school. And I've given this talk um, a few times this past winter, uh, mainly to science programs and at, at, at various schools across the Midwest. So now I'm here giving it to, uh, to you all in art school, so I really can't bullshit, sorry. Um, but with scientists, you definitely can. Uh, and so, so I want you to think about the role that environmental aesthetics or aesthetics in general plays in this whole conversation about nature, our relationship with it, and the climate crisis. 
So environmental aesthetics, for those who aren't familiar, is basically a suite of philosophical questions concerning the appreciation of the world, and moreover, that the world as it is constituted, not simply by particular objects, but also by environments themselves. Therefore, environmental aesthetics extends beyond the narrow confines of what you know, we already consider in the art world, beyond like the appreciation of works, to the aesthetic appreciation of human influence, human constructed, as well as natural environments. And uh, contemporary aesthetics, um, as you know, as discussed in the in the latter half of the 20th century, this thing is so squeaky. Can you all hear the squeak? Is it annoying you? Sorry, I'll I'll stand over here. Uh, it's like a little squeaky right here. So uh, contemporary aesthetics and uh, the neglect of natural beauty have been uh, something that people have been thinking about and writing about, and I would argue um, are applicable here to this story, which I'm going to tell, uh, which is uh, kind of a long and interesting. Uh, sorry about the work that I've been doing. So just as a quick brief overview, I know many of you probably are, are aware, with, aware of these things, but environmental aesthetics has essentially uh, been divided into two uh, fields or, or, or topics. There's the cognitive or the narrative, um, which is where um, knowledge and information about the nature of the object of appreciation is central to its aesthetic appreciation. Nature must therefore be appreciated on its own terms. You go out to the Grand Canyon and you take a picture and you make sure nobody's in the picture. There's no guardrails, there's no human beings. It looks totally sublime and natural. Um, and then there's the non-cognitive or the ambient uh, field of, of environmental aesthetics, which I would argue is um, more important for this uh, conversation. And that's the aesthetics of engagement. Um, and the engagement approach stresses the contextual dimensions of nature and our multi-sensory experiences of it. So viewing the environment as a seamless unity of places, organism, organisms, and perceptions, which challenges the importance of traditional dichotomies, for example, the dichotomy between humans and nature, um, subject and object, et cetera, and therefore appropriate aesthetic experience is held to involve the total immersion of the appreciator in the object of appreciation. So. Um, I really like this quote from an essay by uh, David George Haskell, which is called Notes on an Ecological Aesthetics and Ethics. Um, and I, I, I'll read it slowly. I think it's uh, really important and is a good, uh, is a good sort of uh, jumping off point. So once we collectively, as humans, as people, as persons, have an integrated sense of aesthetics, we can begin to discern what is beautiful and what is broken about a place. And from there, I believe, and I also believe <laughs> that we can begin to form an objective or near objective foundation for ethical discernment. Answers emerge from the community of life itself, filtered through human experience and consciousness. And so I really want to ask this question, should scientists, uh, myself uh, included, calling myself a scientist, and environmental activists and others, utilize this philosophy to help tackle the climate problem? So, Obviously, I think yes, and that's why I'm here teaching at an art school and interacting with students who are creative makers um, every day. How can we um, harness the, the ability of the creatives in our world to help scientists like myself tackle this really important and almost existential uh, problem? Um, and this has been written about before. I'm, this is not like some new idea that I had. Um, so these are just two examples of, of, of peer-reviewed manuscripts um, which talk about this. For example, climate change, environmental aesthetics, and global, global environmental justice, cultural studies, and other um, uh, topics which have been written about uh, which, which concern the uh, synthesis of art, design, and science, and in this case, uh, environmental science or climate science. And so I want to flash through a few, um, uh, a few works of art that some of my students have actually um, produced um, in my classes um, as, as their, generally as their final projects, and I have all their permissions for this. Um, and so I'll start with this one, which is like really one of my favorites. It was um, uh, titled Climate Deniers on Vacation um, by Katie Wittenberg, and uh, it's, it's really aesthetically fun to look at. Um, I don't know if you recognize some of the people in this, but those are the Koch brothers, Scott Pruitt, etc. Um, sitting on polar bears on vacation, I guess. And in the background, the mountains actually form the shape of uh, the temp part of the temperature record, um, the global temperature record. So this is a really good example of how you can kind of use um, aesthetics, use things that are, that are interesting to look at to convey important scientific information. Um, 
here's another example um, by one of my students last semester who's also here. Um, and uh, Micah's project was looking at the role of gender and gender identity and environmental justice and environmental equity. Um, and so uh, they did a really like sort of wonderful um, analysis and research project and then also produced um, a visual representation of that work. And um, I love the synthesis of using something that's visual and easy to, to look at with sort of really deep, impactful, and important information about these sorts of things. Um, here are a few more that are really uh, kind of, kind of uh, stark, I guess, to look at. So we have um, a cartoon about uh, Venice flooding. I don't know if you, you all are familiar in the news. Uh, the city of Venice in Italy regularly floods. Now part of that's due to the fact that it's sinking, and then part of it's due to sea level rise, which is a direct result of climate change. Um, and then on the left um, is a really cool negative image um, of coral reefs, which have been um, I'm actually not sure how they did it, but um, uh, my student in collaboration with their um, seventh grade class that they were um, you know, uh, interning with or whatever, um, taught, her how to, taught them how to um, corrupt the JPEGs to produce these um, interesting images. And the symbolism of that was uh, that we're sort of slowly destroying the coral reefs, um, but they still look beautiful um, when we go see them. They still exist currently. Um, and then this is a... a, a, a my final image that I want to show on this uh, section, um, which is about severe weather in the Midwest and how severe weather is likely to get worse. Um, and the only way that you can actually read this, and this is a terrible picture because I am 100% not an artist, um, but the only way that you can read this actually is with a, a black light over, over it. And so it's like, you know, uh, the power goes out, there's a tornado that hits your house or something. Anyway, these are all different um, sort of representations of, um, really important science and really important scientific conclusions regarding climate change in a way that I, as a scientist, could never do. Um, and so this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I wanted to, basically I wanted to brag about how great my students are, and they all came to support me, which is really sweet. Um, so let me change gears then. I've given you this uh, little taste, um, and I hopefully, hopefully I've gotten your brains um, thinking and moving, and now I want to get to sort of the meat of of what I'm gonna talk about, which is um, the work that I've been doing the last year or so with a design student. So before I do that, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about myself and why I'm here at SAIC. So I got my PhD in 2012 from the University of California in Irvine in the Department of Earth System Science. It's actually one of the first departments that was constructed to solely address the issue of abrupt uh, human-caused climate change. Um, I got to work with some really great people, um, and because of that work that I did at UC Irvine, I was able to work for six years after my PhD for NASA, which all of my students think is really cool, but I promise you I was just uh, sitting in a cubicle, um, and it wasn't that cool. But um, I did work at the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, which is in Pasadena, uh, for six years, uh, doing some really interesting stuff, but I decided that um, for a myriad reasons uh, that I needed to change um, directions. So prior to that, prior to coming here, um, this is just a sample of some of the work that I did as uh, what many of you might consider like a scientist with a capital S, um, looking at the, the global impact of smoke from fires on climate and uh, circulation patterns in the atmosphere. Um, looking at the effect of um, particulates and aerosols in the south e southeastern United States and how that might be masking um, warming from climate change, and then also looking at how fires in Africa can limit um, or inhibit uh, thunderstorms and rainfall uh, due to in interactions with smoke on um, sunlight and warming. So um, just really briefly, uh, I'm gonna do one slide on the conclusions from all these papers. So this, this work, um, basically we showed that uh, particulates from smokestacks, uh, those things that you see come out, the sulfur and the other um, waste products of coal burning and, and natural gas and oil burning, um, actually uh, trap and reflect sunlight in the atmosphere. And this can prevent heating from showing up at the surface from global warming. And so actually these aerosols from smokestacks in very polluted areas of, of, the, of the world, I mean, we were studying the southeastern United States, um, 
can actually hide the effects of climate change. And ironically, cleaning the air, um, making it better for asthma sufferers and other people, um, can actually exacerbate the warming. Um, and so this has implications for regions of the world that are in the process of cleaning up their air, like Eastern Asia, uh, South Asia, um, parts, of, parts of Africa, and um, Eastern Europe as well. So um, this was important, and it actually was pretty controversial, and it took a really long time to publish it, so that's why it's here. <laughs> um, but then I also want to talk about this paper, which, um, in my opinion, is like my uh, favorite paper that I've written, and it's the motivation for the work that I'm going to show you for the rest of this talk. Um, and so the one slide conclusion for this paper is that forest fires, or grassland fires, in Africa um, through their emission of particulates and smoke, um, that smoke gets into clouds, it interacts with uh, sunlight, and can actually reduce uh, rainfall and change the local hydrology um, and agricultural practices in these very economically vul uh, ecologically vulnerable tropical regions. So actually, fires and their emission of smoke can actually in inhibit or impair uh, the ability for clouds to rain, and a less rainy uh, climate regime can actually make fires more likely. So fires beget fires beget fires through this positive feedback loop. Um, and this is a, a really important paper. I, a lot of my, my work as a, a, a scientist has been studying the impact of fire um, on climate, and when we came to this uh, conclusion, it was, um, in my opinion, um, it was, it was an advancement in the field of understanding this type of feedback. So, <laughs> sorry, that was very stark. So those are, that's, a, that's an overview of some of, my, some of my work. So I'll return, I was at JPL and I was, um, you know, doing this, doing this work and um, sitting at my computer and, 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 and looking at these climate problems. And then um, in 2016, uh, Donald Trump won the presidency, and leading up to it, you know, we were starting, the cracks were starting to show with the U.S.'s commitment to tackling climate change. Um, and as you all know, Donald Trump is a notorious climate denier and also hates uh, trans people for some reason. So basically, I am a pariah for Donald Trump, and so this was really a call to action for me. Um, I had enough of sitting around at NASA publishing work, and it was time for me to, to come here to interact with, with creative people and people who may have a different vision and a different way of tackling these problems. And so that was a big motivation for uh, why I came to SAIC and why I'm doing this, uh, which in my opinion is some of the most important work I've done, more important than some of these other things. Um, so yeah, so I came here and they wrote this like cheesy blurb about me, which was fun. <laughs> Um, if y'all want to read it, it's like in that magazine. Um, and these are some of the courses that I teach, uh, if there's any students in here who have never taken my courses before. Um, Abrupt Climate Change will be a new one that I'm teaching next year, and also at Oxbow this summer. So let's talk about the project then. Uh, this is all background information. Now you know who I am, what motivates me, uh, why I'm giving this, why I'm giving this talk in the first place, why I'm thinking about these things, and why I want us to have this really um, important conversation. And that's this idea that perhaps we can use all of these inputs, we, perhaps we can harness um, the creative uh, abilities and thinking processes of artists and designers and others um, to redesign, to rethink, and to transcend science as, as we've known as I was trained uh, you know, in my PhD program. And so I've been working with a very talented um, designer, uh, master's student uh, at Carnegie Mellon, actually, through JPL and other um, funding, other ways of funding, um, Adrian Galvin. And so a lot of the work that I'm going to show is work that we've done together. Um, and he's <laughs> has a far better aesthetic eye than I do. So a lot of the graphics that I'm going to show you were, were done uh, by Adrian or in collaboration with Adrian. So I want to make sure he gets the proper credit. So again, the motivation for this was fires in Africa. Um, I had the great fortune to spend a few weeks in Africa in 2016 before coming to SAIC, uh, talking with folks who are sort of on the ground interacting with uh, these, these fires, which are burning in savanna regions and also tropical forest regions in Africa every year as part of cultural practice, as part of agricultural practice. Um, 
most of the farming in Africa is done for, um, uh, for survival. Not, not a lot of it is industrial scale, although they are starting to become, um, there is starting to be more and more industrial farming in Africa. Um, and so they're very reliant on rainfall um, and climate conditions to be just right uh, for burning to actually be beneficial for, for, um, for farming and for other things, for returning nutrients to the soil. And I had a, a great conversation with, um, with someone who, Chris, who lived in Zambia, um, who had sort of a tangential knowledge of what climate change was, but I just thought that what he said to me really stood out and uh, further uh, cemented uh, the desire that I had to actually sort of, I know it's cheesy and millennial, but make a difference. I don't know, I'm a millennial and I'm cheesy, so you know. Um, so what he said was, in 41 years, I never left Zambia, but these farms now are so dry this time of year, it doesn't rain anymore. We used to have rain in October and even September, but now it's November. I don't know why, but we need water. It's so dry. I guess it's global warming, but we need water in Lake Kariba or we won't survive. And I, I say this because I want to highlight that I do this work, and I think it's addressing the climate crisis is important work because we in the global north tend to forget that most of the climate impacts from climate change will be felt in the global south. And the global south was essentially not invited to the fossil fuel party, was not invited to the industrialization party, and now they're feeling the effects. So this is important work and we need to keep uh, the people that will be most affected and the ecosystems that will be most affected by climate change in our, in our minds when we think about this kind of stuff. So, um, so the, the project that I'm doing uh, utilizes satellite data, and the satellite that we're using for this project is called the MISER satellite. It stands for the Multi-Angle Imaging Spectroradiometer. I'll let you figure out how the acronym works, but that's a very NASA thing to do. Um, Multi-Imaging Spectroradiometer. It's really two words, but now it's four uh, letters. So this is a, a, a picture of the, the cameras from MISER before they launched it. Uh, in 1998. I, I was not on the project then. Um, I'm not that old. So um, it has nine cameras, and they can view the Earth from nine different angles. Um, and this is really important because what we're looking at, what I'm looking at, what I'm passionate about, is smoke that's coming off of fires. And so the MISER instrument allows us to see the smoke in sort of three dimensions. We can see how high it is above the surface. And this has important implications for um, climate, um, because where the smoke is getting into the atmosphere is going to impact how the climate's going to respond. So it's really important to know this going into it, uh, going into any study of the climate in Africa, in the tropics, anywhere there's fires actually. Um, and so this is the instrument that we're using. And this is the software program which I had a hand in designing at JPL, um, which uses the MISER satellite data to determine how high smoke from fires is in the atmosphere. Um, so the image on the left is just, it's a little hard to see here, but you can, uh, this is, let me see, I guess I don't have a pointer or anything. Wow, like out of my element. Um, so that's actually the Bay Area. I don't know. And those were the wine country fires in 2017. And you can see the, the fires are, uh, the smoke is, being blown by the wind southward. And then the image on the right is after running it through the software program, it outputs the height of that smoke. And so you can see the height ranges anywhere from half of a kilometer to two kilometers above the surface. So that's about, you know, a couple thousand feet. And we did this, well, me and a, a lot of, um, really patient and dedicated interns at NASA JPL over the course of four years did this for every fire on Earth that we could observe with our satellite for four years, from 2008 through 2011. And we have a gigantic database of these plumes that we want climate scientists to use and to study. The problem is the website to access those plumes looks like this, um, and definitely designed by a scientist. Um, so you can see it's like, <laughs> you can laugh, it's fine, yeah, it's bad. Um, and so you can see that, first of all, like it's, it's difficult to even know where to start. Um, it's divided into these really sort of random regions. Um, the search function is, is very confusing to see, 
my name is hasn't even been updated on the site from before my transition. Like, there's just a lot of problems with this. And I'm using this case to illustrate a larger problem in science, and that is that scientists think they know the right way to do everything, but actually, like, this is sometimes the output. And it's very confusing, and it's not, it's not useful, and then I would argue it actually inhibits the doing of science, okay? So, some of the challenges, as I've already sort of outlined, um, the, the miser plume data set is extremely large, it's challenging to work with, Data storage and distribution infrastructure has evolved enormously since the satellite was launched, and it just makes it very difficult for users to access, download, and analyze these data. Um, and there's a lack of visual or aesthetic feedback with this website, with this, um, with this software program. So climate scientists outside of NASA, basically outside of me, um, find it really difficult to select download substance of this data for their research because they can't really find what they want. And without any feedback or visual feedback, users can't figure out where to start or how to filter unwanted data. And I would argue that all of these challenges actually um, lead us to do not as good science as we could do otherwise because we spend so much time trying to figure out how to download it, how to process it, how to access it, that by the time it gets to actually doing the scientists, you've lost steam, you've lost science, you've lost steam, you've lost motivation, you've lost sight of what the question was. And I would argue that redesigning this in this particular case, but you can, you can extrapolate it to sort of everything, can actually help scientists do better science. So the first permutation of this talk was like, can scientists help designers help scientists do better science? I hated it, but that's the idea. So I want to walk you through the design process. And for those of you in the room that are scientists or are familiar with how scientists do the scientific method, which you know there are lots of problems with, I want to compare and contrast the two and argue that using the design process is actually um, perhaps a better way to go forward to think about it. So. Before I get to that, this is the quote unquote scientific method. Now I have lots of problems with um, defining a strict scientific method for doing science, but this is kind of the scientific method as it, as it exists if, you, if you're out there and, and if you're in ninth grade science class and they teach you like, this is how scientists do science. You um, have a hypothesis, you question things, you propose, um, you, propose, uh, you propose solutions, you imagine a world where this uh, hypothesis um, results in a theory, you explore data, and then once you've uh, done that appropriately enough, I guess, you move to experimental phase and you measure, you research, you test, you analyze um, things, and then hopefully uh, you get to a conclusion or a theory and you publish it and you discuss it and you talk to people about it and you present it. And that is, for all intents and purposes, the scientific method um, as we all learn it in eighth grade. Here's the design process, um, and I had my, my student Adrian make this, um, make this, uh, this schematic for me to match the scientific method in a way. And so you have, uh, with the design process, for, for those of you in the room who are designers, you have uh, step one is um, understanding the problem, empathizing, um, learning, and listening. And then you have an ideation phase where you explore and you visualize and imagine, which I would I kind of liken to the hypothesis phase. And then you have a prototyping phase where you um, create something and you test and you observe and you retest and you propose new solutions and that's kind of like the experimental phase and then you have the refinement phase um, where you actually deliver something that you've designed and that's kind of like the conclusion phase of the scientific method but there's a key and distinct difference between these two and that is that scientists don't care about people in the beginning uh, usually um, so we start right in with a hypothesis um, whereas designers actually talk to the people that are going to use the thing that they're designing to empathize with them, to learn from them, and to listen for them. And designers and artists and makers and creators do this before they even start um, ideating and prototyping art or making anything. And I would argue that scientists could really uh, learn from this and think before that first hypothesis step, can I understand and empathize and learn and listen with the people 
who my science is going to ultimately impact. So I want to walk you through the design process that we did for this particular um, project. But again, the theme of this um, is to both present my own research, but also to get you thinking about how this can be extrapolated to maybe everything. It's a kind of a it's it's a bit of a bold um, vision and undertaking. So. Uh, the first step is the contextual inquiry or the understanding uh, phase. So you have to understand as a designer and as a scientist, I would argue, uh, the people and the problem. And this is a, it's often referred to as contextual inquiry. Um, it's a design technique in which people are studied in their context of action. So in this case, scientists are studied using this horrible website. Um, <laughs> in order to build a clear understanding of what they need and what they do. So in this particular project with the MISER team, uh, this entailed interviews, discussions, workflow demonstrations, presentations, hands-on stuff, before we even got to uh, a prototyping or an ideation phase. So these are some of Adrian's inquiry notes, and I honestly am just putting them up here because if my inquiry notes looked like this, I would be, um, super happy. They're just so beautiful. Um, so this, these are some of the notes that he took during that understanding and contextual inquiry phase uh, with myself and others on our team. So the next phase was um, some ideation sketching, uh, basically drawing interfaces. So sketching uh, in, this, in the context of this project is a low cost. Um, you don't need to program anything on the computer yet, and a very intuitive way of iterating on ideas and creating artifacts with the team that we can respond and have conversations about, throw ideas around, and it, this um, helps to not only build a collective sort of team identity, but it also saves time and resources before you get to the like, I'm gonna make this thing on a, on a laptop now or on a computer. Um, so this was uh, Adrian's first ideation of how to redesign the website that I showed you. Um, how to column layout, sandbox, some visual variables. We didn't really like it as scientists, and so he scrapped it. And this was the second ideation, which is much closer to the finished result. Um, there were filters and modification history, and there was a much more adaptive form, uh, or there would be when it was programmed. Um, full data download, a palette investigator, and other things. So then, uh, once this ideation process and ongoing uh, with this ideation process, there was intense collaboration between myself, the scientist, so this is a, a very, uh, I look really serious in this picture, um, and one of our computer program designers um, during this phase of uh, of the project. And I want to stress that collaboration was really important to getting this project done. Without collaboration, the final result would not have been nearly as good as it ended up being. Um, and so as a scientist, I can say this, and I did say this when I gave this talk at, like, for example, the University of Michigan. Um, so scientists say that they collaborate a lot, but they, it was a totally different world collaborating with designers where it really felt like we were doing this together, even though I am not a designer or an artist. So this, I, this process Adrian called co-designing with scientists, and I really like that term. Um, showing these sketches and sharing ideas allowed um, both us to give them a clear idea of what we actually needed and what we would use. Um, and you know, what, for designers and for, for, for makers and, and creatives, when you are creating a novel visualization, it's very difficult to imagine what it will show eventually. And so working in close collaboration with scientists um, this ensured that the whole project stayed on the right track. And I also want to emphasize that this, the, this part of the project was 12 weeks. So it was pretty, pretty quick, actually. Um, so this was the, the paper prototype. So we haven't even gotten to the computer, right? So we do a paper prototype, which is still resource efficient, um, and then we tested it. And then we, once we did that and it looked good, then we started to make digital prototypes, um, and we, we drew on the expertise of software designers, um, software engineers, um, to create uh, this, ultimately, this software program. So this is the first prototype. It was okay, but then we um, made it more complex. So this is the second paper prototype, and then the second testing session, and actually this is uh, Adrian. This is his only cameo that he would let me show. Um, 
And then f we have the second digital prototype. So finally, we had something. And the last phase of the project, uh, the sort of polishing and the refinement phase, uh, the scientists were, we were, I was a little bit detached from this part of the project process. Um, and so when Adrian came to show us the final result, literally my jaw dropped to the floor. So just to remind you, this is the original website, and I had a hand in creating this, so it's okay for you to laugh and, and roast me. It's bad, it's bad, so it's bad. And then this is what it looks like now when you open it. It's exactly the same data, but it's so much easier to select among filters. To, there's different views of the earth where you can see actually the, how many fires there are, that's the color, and how high they are right away, right? All the fires that we've done in Africa, you can see without having to do anything how high they are in the atmosphere and how many there are in, in a particular uh, region. So already there's more information than this. Okay, and I'll just flip through a few screenshots of what you can do with this program. So you can do XY plots, you can do pie charts. Again, lots of different filters. You can select different regions. Um, so we can look here um, at, uh, so these are, these are four different regions. The Amazon is, is over here on the bottom. These are two views, I believe, of the Amazon. Then we have the Pacific Northwest in the top left and then the sea in between Borneo and Sumatra in Indonesia on the top right. So lots of different views that you can zoom in and you can lay on top of Google Earth to give you an idea of where these fires are occurring. Um, the bubbles are sized, in this case, to how strong the fire is. So we can already see where the stronger fires are, where the smaller fires are, without even having to do anything except click on it. So this is like amazing. Um, you can also filter it by, by biome, um, by, by ecosystem type. So by, by tropical forest, uh, by savanna, by evergreen forest, by deciduous forest, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you know, we can zoom in um, on different regions, different times of the year, and then also look at the entire globe and see every plume that we ever digitized. So I know that in the, in the grand scheme of like climate questions, looking at fires across the planet is maybe not the most pressing issue, but I wanted to use this as, because it is my expertise and also um, it's a really illustrative example of how we can harness the power um, of designers, of artists, to improve the way that we're interacting with these, with these interfaces. And there's even um, the ability to kind of zoom in and zoom out, and it's dynamic. It'll adjust the grid size, um, giving you a lot more information just right off the bat before even doing any what I would call science, quote unquote science or analysis, right? Before even getting there, um, so much that you can do. So the next step, so this all happened, and then the next steps that we're still in the process of, and I don't want to give away the whole secret because Adrian is uh, defending his master's thesis soon, and then we're going to start writing this up in, like a, in a formal publication. But we've been working on this together all year, doing these sort of controlled environmental studies and surveys of other scientists, looping other scientists in. So this is a, a chart that Adrian made uh, of a testing session that we did together. So we redid the software, and then he put it in front of me, and he said, okay, now go be a scientist for an hour and a half and explain to me all of the insights that you're now getting from this new software. What are you doing differently this time that you were not doing before when you were using this software program? And so you can see he's color-coded it, so you have um, <clears throat> uh, interface adjustments, which is me changing to a new thing, um, a new visualization state, the observations that I'm making, uh, the questions that I'm asking, and then the hypotheses that I'm forming from those questions, just new hypotheses, just from using this redesigned data set. And then finally, we ended the session after about an hour um, when I had what I would consider a complete paper topic that had been formed from just playing around with this new interface. And so we're trying to argue, ultimately, that redesigning this software has actually enabled myself and other users to be better scientists. And to get at that, and to get at that, what makes someone a good scientist, uh, we sent out a survey um, to a bunch of scientists, a bunch of climate scientists, um, and we tried to kind of group 
their responses to these questions in a quote unquote redesigned scientific method, a designer, user, human focused scientific method. And so uh, the, the point of this, right, and the, the end goal of all this, and we haven't quite gotten to the conclusions of, of, of what this all means, um, but we're revisiting the initial drivers component of this, the understanding component, the empathizing component, the hypothesizing component, and in perhaps introducing a human component at this stage to scienti of scientific inquiry, um, especially in climate science, I would argue, perhaps is a must. Perhaps we should start doing this from now on. Perhaps this is a really important, and, and there are probably scientists maybe who are here who are like, I already did that, and that's, you know, Good, that's good, like you're a good scientist, I would argue. Um, but I would argue that a lot of times scientists don't do that and um, perhaps that's something that we should consider going forward, um, that we can learn a lot from the design process, that we can learn a lot from artists and creatives and makers um, to ultimately be better scientists and better stewards of the earth. So I know I talked really fast, but that means that there's lots of time for questions, so thank you very much. Anyone have any questions? No questions. You're just that good, huh? Yeah. I wonder whether we should worry. I wonder whether we should worry at all about switching from designers to artists who are maybe or often less concerned with precision. Artists use exaggeration. They use, they change emphases. And if that might contribute, might make it easier for the people who are inclined to doubt information, scientific information that's inconvenient to them would cost them money. I, well, the, what, what the designers have done is, I can see the clear efficacy of that. I wonder whether the deniers might find it easier to point, well, that's an artistic rendition, therefore we shouldn't believe it as readily. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a valid point. I, I wouldn't argue that um, artists and designers in this context are totally analogous, that, you know, we would, it would be the same interactions. But I have spoken with a few artists who are really um, intellectually engaged with climate change and have done research and have really produced uh, good work with respect to climate change. And one of the frustrations that they always um, profess to me is that they wish that scientists would include artists and makers and creators from the very beginning of the process. So the analogy really is like, let's do this together from the beginning rather than oftentimes scientists at the end will be like, I have this result and it looks terrible in this paper, but I want you to reimagine it and communicate it in like, you know, the Wall Street Journal and make like a nice image of it. And artists and designers will do that, but often feel like they were never involved in the whole process up to that point and now are just being asked to produce this pretty picture. Um, and I would argue that it's like very important to include artists from the very beginning um, so that there is like a lot of valuable insight in this problem in particular that artists could give from the very beginning in a different way than designers, definitely. And so it's not a total analogy, but um, I think it's like really important to harness the, the like uh, creative intellect and also just the, the, the academic intellect of artists from the very beginning of any inquiry and scientific inquiry. If you're gonna use them, you know, use them. Uh, don't just use them at the end. It's, it should be a collaborative process, was kind of the point that I was, yeah. Mm -hmm. In, oh. <laughs> Ask your question again. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. 
sorry, I'm, I'm really impressed by the sound of my own voice. Would you be able to speak a little bit about the, the kind of cultural inertia within the scientific community that's kind of like making this model a little bit more scarce and like making um, it difficult or less common for scientists to harness that, that, that uh, creative capital? Yeah, absolutely. So I gave this talk at JPL at the University of Miami in Ohio and the University of Michigan. And each time it was to science, a room of scientists. And when I gave it at JPL, it was like on deaf ears. Um, people were really resistant to it. There, there is a big hesitancy to, to, among scientists, specifically at NASA JPL, to thinking that artists and designers can contribute anything. So this work was done at JPL and it was like, took a lot of convincing um, to do that. But when I gave this talk at the University of Michigan to scientists, they bought in immediately, actually, which surprised me, believe it or not. I was, I was really scared that I was gonna be met with, oh, you're not a real scientist, like that's not how scientists do things. Scientists, capital S, scientists like do it this way, and this is just like feel good art stuff. But actually, like people really bought into it. So there might be, um, either a change in ideology or maybe no one has just stood up like I have and said, I'm a trained scientist and like, we should do this stuff, you know? So I, I do think that there is a cultural reticency, but I actually don't think it's as, as strong as you think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. So this follows actually on the last question. Um, there are other kinds of cultural differences among scientists. For example, there are social scientists. There are scientists who deal more with human identities and interactions and so forth. And I'm wondering if, in particular, that initial driver category might be really expanded in some areas where we are studying ourselves as opposed to studying ourselves in the context of some other system, like the natural climate system. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great point, actually. So I saw, I had the good fortune to see a talk at the American Geophysical Union conference in December that was a collaboration, actually, between a social scientist and a drought hydrologist about um, attitudes towards drought and con conveying information about drought in a pretty remote state in the Amazon. And they definitely had a huge human component at the beginning because it was affecting humans. And I actually think that the work that they did with the drought indices and uh, conveying the drought information and, and studying the drought actually was, yeah, better and perhaps um, more, better is like such a subjective word, but um, it was perhaps more, I don't know, I don't want to use the wrong word, maybe worthwhile or maybe maybe more, had a, had a, had a bigger impact. Um, and so I think, yeah, that's a really good point is that not all scientists are the same. I can only really speak as a climate scientist, someone who uh, I guess in the field of science would consider themselves a physical scientist. Um, and so I notice in my experience, yeah, there's much less of that human understanding empathetic component. But among social sciences, for sure, there's, um, there's a lot to be, to be learned and, and, and taken from, from that approach as well. Yeah, good point. I was um, wondering, also thank you so much for your talk, it was incredible. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, like how long the duration of this project went on for and also if the artists that you were collaborating with, um, if they were paid or if they were a volunteer and like how you like um, did time management and that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah, so um, the initial phase, all the ideation and prototyping and all of that was 12 weeks and they were paid. Yeah, so it was a paid... Um, it was a grant, basically. We applied for a grant uh, through NASA and the design team at um, California Institute for CalArts. Actually, I don't know what it stands for. CalArts. You all know it. Um, <laughs> so it was through CalArts and JPL is like a synthesis, and also Caltech. So there was a lot of moving pieces, but they were paid um, pretty well. And I think it's, and having talked to artists and my students, it's really important to pay artists. Absolutely, 100%. Um, and so that process was about 12 weeks. The second part, like these two slides from, oh, sorry, from here uh, forward, I've been working with um, 
with Adrian, and he is a student right now, so I'm not paying him. Like, he's doing this through his school, um, but he did come to Chicago to work with me, and I did, like, pay for his travel and all of that and, and expenses and stuff. So, um, and that's been, like, a nine-month process or whatever month it is right now, from September to now. <laughs> so, yeah, about, about seven months. Thanks so much, Mika. That was a wonderful talk. Um, following up just on that question, I think one thing that strikes me is that, um, you know, it is often quite natural that, you, I mean, sort of what's coming up here is in a sense that when there's a really important issue, you can't always leave it to experts, right? Because, um, uh, and I think we're understanding that more and more in sort of the conditions of the Anthropocene. No one discipline can suitably like uh, address these issues. One thing that just struck me in how you're describing you applying for the grant and collaboration is that it's sort of like you have this um, collaborator at Carnegie Mellon, at JPL it was Caltech and CalArts. And I think it's quite natural that often collaboration takes on an interinstitutional characteristic uh, or character. But by the same token, I just want to say, hey, you know, I bet there's some really good I designers here um, just as good as at Caltech, and I'm not putting, or at CalArts, I'm not putting that on you, I'm putting that actually in terms of how we think about our own kinds of expertise and our own possibilities and potential for collaboration within an institution. It's always very sort of like flashy and shiny and attractive to somehow do some inter-institutional collaboration because um, you know, that gets a lot of attention, that gets a certain kind of buy-in, but I really hope that institutions like Caltech and CalArts and SEIC also see um, the value within their own institutions and the ability to collaborate within rather than uh, externally. So I, I'm, I, and you're already doing that through obviously the work that the students are doing in the classes and all of that. So I really applaud that. I think it's so wonderful. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, um, part of the reason I gave this talk was so that people could know what I'm doing at SAIC because I would love to talk to lots of people here and see what see what happens. I know you make a good point that collaboration is sometimes given a lot of lip service and then not given a lot of actual like committed work. Um, and it is flashier when it's like a grant between CalArts and JPL and Caltech. Those are all like big names and in and, and, and Southern California or whatever. Um, and so yeah, I mean, great points. I think that's, that's why I'm here actually. Ul ulterior motives. And to show this wonderful work. Thanks, Mika. So I, I'm wondering about, um, this is a follow-up on some of the questions that have been asked already. I'm wondering about why you couched your talk in terms of people, artists, designers, scientists. Because I was sort of hoping that there would be more um, attention to the science, the model of how we do science versus the model of design. Because, for example, in the history of architecture, there is quite a there is a there is a there is a important strand in which architects are notorious for often not collaborating with the people they work with and they impose their designs on them right so i was hoping that we could pull away from the people as such and i know you couch it in terms of people and talk more in terms of the models that are involved and how they can inform each other and so my question is um what would be like the main, so, so it would be the design model that would allow scientists to work better, right? To allow science. But does that mean that the role of design in this case is simply instrumental to help the scientists work better? Or is there a more um, end goal that design can bring to this more than just instrument, more than just an instrumental role? Did that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes, that's a really good question. And I have to think about it a little bit. So before I do that, I will comment that um, I do, you're right to point out that I, it is couched in terms of people, and that was deliberate, and obviously. And I think I did that because I'm kind of on this kick right now in all my classes and in my thinking and as, a, as, a, as, a, as an academic, that science is done by people, and it doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it's done by, by people, living, breathing people, and there's um, ways in which those people do science that um, affects the science, even though we like to think that science is purely objective, um, it's, it's maybe not, or it's, it's at least it's done by people. Um, as for your second question, I think that's a really good point. I think working with Adrian and looking at how the design process is done um, and, and, and talking to artists, um, 
the way we think about how science is done is often very linear. Um, and the way that designers and artists, in my experience, do make things and design things is not nearly as linear as scientists like to think they're doing. And I don't think that scientists do science linearly, but I think we think we do science linearly. And so I think we could probably learn from the, the nonlinearity, to use a science term, of the design process of art making to, to do science in a way that's not so, here's my hypothesis, here's my testing, I'm now at a result that I can publish. Perhaps it's much more of a, of a cyclical, like feeding on itself process that involves thinking uh, not always of the end goal of the thing, of the paper that you're gonna write, but of the process. And I've actually been interrogating my own thoughts with that this year because I'm kind of at this point where I've been doing a lot of thinking with this and a lot of doing this stuff, but I haven't written a paper about it. And part of me, the scientist in me, is like, oh, you've got to write a paper, otherwise it's not real. You didn't really do it. And I'm trying to get away from that because I think uh, it's valuable to have just done this thinking and to do this presenting and to talk to people about it and that science sometimes uh, is really hyper-focused on like what comes at the end in a way that working with Adrian, um, there is an end goal, but it's much more about the process and it's, much, it's a much more malleable process to changes in direction. Like we came up with that survey like halfway through the process. And so that's something that scientists sometimes do, but as a scientist myself, is not a model that I've typically operated with. And so I think incorporating that nonlinearity and cyclicalness is a really valuable thing. But I will keep thinking about your question. Hi. Um, so I am a graphic designer, and I also come from a medical background. Like, I was in nursing school before I came here. So I find, like, really interesting intersections between medical biology and graphic design. Um, but I think that one big part, or, like, there is a memory that I had of being in biochemistry and reading articles and kind of wondering to myself, why do I care? Or like, why should people care? Um, and a lot of times I've noticed in scientific articles, it's scientists writing for scientists. Um, and same with art. A lot of times it's artists making art for other artists. And that creates an exclusivity. But then when you incorporate both into design, and good, de good design shouldn't be noticed. Um, when you incorporate both, like it makes everyone understand a lot clearer. Like the difference between the first website and the second one was absolutely stark. Um, and I could visually just see what you were doing. Um, I love the different filters. But I just wanted to say that like what you're doing is incredible in helping people understand what you're doing mm -hmm. and making this information accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think the issue of accessibility is really important. And I know as a scientist, like we're often taught that um, you should just do science and ask scientific questions for the sake of science, which is kind of like what you said. And I think sometimes artists make art for the sake of art, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that model is totally fine, and it's been done for a long time, and people are good at it. Um, as a climate scientist who thinks every day about like the existential threat of climate change, I'm worried about it, and I can't sleep at night sometimes, and I want to just do it better. And so that's where this came from. Like I want to be better at it, and so, that involves me coming to SAC, talking to artists, talking to designers, and like, how can we do it better? It's not to say that everyone necessarily has to do that and has to follow that model, but for me, it's been a really good growth experience and learning experience, so, yeah. So my question is the opposite of Raja's, because he, he wants more science. I, w I was hoping to hear more about how to make scientists more aware of the people um, who are affected right, by, you know, so we have the people who are affected and then we have the people who make policy. And so how to um, make the science more accessible, 
um, to the general population, but also presented in a way that the people who make the decisions about <laughs> the climate will, will, you know. So I, so the connections to that. So I can see changing the model so scientists have better access to the information and can come to different kinds of conclusions. But then to go beyond that to communicate that information in a way um, that's effective for the people who are affected, but then also the people who make the decisions. All the naysayers is like no, no, no. You know. So to get define find the people who, in the language that you use, are activated. Mm -hmm. And so, and then, you know, do something to change. Because, you, know, you know, how do we prevent the, you know, catastrophe? Mm -hmm. um, that's what I wanted to Yeah, no, so that's that. a great point, thank you. And um, yeah. if I give this talk next year, hopefully you will know the answer to that. Because that was what, that's what motivated me. That's yeah. what motivated this from the beginning, is um, how can we reach uh, the people that, that need to be reached. And I, part of the motivation came, I attended this workshop uh, residency, they called it, at Headlands Institute for the Art in, um, in Marin County. And we met with, it was a group for like a five day weekend retreat. Um, and it was climate scientists, artists who have been uh, working in the environmental climate sort of realm, and then policymakers. And we had some amazing conversations about that exact point. And one, I want to share like one anecdote, um, which is tangentially related and hopefully um, get, let, gets people thinking. Scientists um, often identify a problem, right? Like, uh, I'll use an example. In, um, in India and Pakistan, um, people use cook stoves to cook their food, and they use like um, animal dung or cow dung, and that emits a uh, really like noxious plume of smoke, dark smoke, which has deleterious climate effects and is also bad for human health, et cetera, et cetera. So climate, climate scientists came in and said, uh, we need to get rid of these. They're, they're doing harm and you're all gonna use uh, natural gas stoves, right? That was the solution. So they brought uh, all these natural gas stoves. And I think they've done this in parts of Africa as well. And it turns out that nobody likes how the food tastes from those stoves, right? So they never even thought to talk to the people, <laughs> they just identify this problem. So I think that gets to your point of like, how can we do better? And maybe this is like a first orders thinking about like collaboration, not in lip service, but like really collaborating to like solve these really important problems. And addressing policymakers, yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'm exasperated. I spent hours on Twitter arguing with climate deniers. So, you know, it's like, but yeah, it's definitely like, that's a great question and hopefully, uh, over the course of my career, actually, hopefully, much sooner than that, because we only have like twelve years left, um, we'll get we'll get somewhere. Yeah. Any other questions? Or you can come talk to me after this too. I'll hang out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.